It's not too late. That's the title of his sermon. He said sometimes that when we get to become seniors, it's too late to change our characters. And I've heard many people say, no, I'm too old, I cannot change. Let me tell you that in the name of Jesus, it is never too late. We can all be changed. And that's what we're going to find out in this story. There's nothing that cannot be changed by the transforming power of the love of God. So please open your Bibles to Luke 15, verses 1 to 3. I'm just going to read this verse. Luke 15, verses 1 to 3. And the sinners drew near to him to hear him. You know who the tax collectors were, right? They were very loved by everyone? No. No. They were traitors. They worked for the Romans. And they, um, they stole money from the Jews. They charged even more than what the taxes were in order for them to they keep more money and they became rich and so all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near Jesus and they were listening to him and the Pharisees and scribes complained saying this man Jesus receives sinners and eats with them how can this be in other words here are the Pharisees and the scribes saying, how can Jesus spend time with these people? They have no hope. They will never change. They are traitors. They are sinners. They are too old to change. They've gone too far. Have you gone too far? Do you feel that you've gone too far away from Jesus, that you cannot change? And there is no hope, no hope for you. Do you feel that you're too old, that you cannot be changed anymore? Let me tell you, Jesus was spending time here with those who had no hope, according to society. They had no hope, but Jesus was spending time with them. If Jesus spent time with them, it is because they had hope. And so he was. And so when they accused Jesus of spending time with those who had no hope, Jesus told them a story. A story which had three parts. So he spoke this parable to them. And this was actually the answer that Jesus gave them. This parable. And it describes three ways in which God can relate to those who apparently have no hope. The first part of the story of this parable is about a lost sheep. A lost sheep. The second part was a lost coin. And the third part was parable of the prodigal son. The lost sheep knew that it was lost. The problem is that it did not know the way back to the father's house. To the shepherd's house. The lost coin is interesting because the lost coin was lost and it didn't know it. And about all, the coin was lost inside the house. Can you believe that some people can be lost within the church and not know it? They think that because they come to church every Saturday, and because they do everything that a Christian is supposed to do, they believe that they are saved, but they may not have any relationship with Jesus Christ. And so they are lost, and they don't know it, just like that coin. And I pray that none of us can become like that coin. I pray that we cannot realize that we are lost without Jesus. Now the third part talks about the prodigal son. This son walked away, he was lost, he knew he was lost, and he also knew the way back to the father's house. 
And so we're going to focus on that story, that third part of the story, the prodigal son. He had run away from his father's house. One day he realized that he was lost. And he knew the way back. Please turn with me to um, now verses 11 to 13. Luke 15, verses 11 to 13. You listening, children? <coughs> children, you hear? Listen to the story. You can do that later. Luke 15, 11 to 13. Then he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. Give me what is mine. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Let's look at those underlying words. A certain man had two sons. Right here we find the relationship that God wants to have with you. He wants you to be his son and his daughter. A certain man had two sons. That is the close relationship that God wants to have with us. And then we find the younger of them saying to his father, Father, give me the portion that belongs to me. Why is it that we think that everything we have belongs to us? And we hear phrases like, this is my life, I do what I want. This is my body, I can treat it the way I want. I can eat what I want, I can dress like I want, I can do whatever I want because, because this is my body. And so we say to God, you just give me the part that belongs to me, don't, don't mess around with me. I can handle that. And what is the consequence of saying that to God? What is the consequence of having that attitude of, don't mess with me, God? It says that not many days after he was born. When we have this attitude towards God, that we know better, that we don't need God to tell me what's good and what's bad, not a long time after, you will be gone before you know it. This is what happened in the story. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country. It is a far country. We'll end up far away from God when we lie to ourselves saying that we don't need God to tell us what's good and what's wrong. When we become self-sufficient, when we don't spend time with Jesus every day, reading our Bibles, talking to Him through prayer, and we think that we can make it on our own, being good citizens, before we know it, without realizing it, just like that point, we will end up far away from Jesus Christ. And I hope that if that is the situation, we can realize that we are lost without Him. This young boy, was tired of obeying rules. He misunderstood the father's love and care. And then he saw the love and care of his father as restrictions. Why do I need to obey you? I know how to take care of myself. The father's protection was seen as restriction. And that's how the devil wants you to think about the Ten Commandments today. He wants you to look at the Ten Commandments and say, these are just restrictions. I don't need to be told what to do. I know what's good and what's bad. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. The Ten Commandments have been given to us in order to make us happy. In order to keep us safe from everything that will destroy our happiness. But this young man thought he didn't need his father to tell him how to live his life. And how many times we act the same way with God. I don't need you, God, to tell me who to choose to marry, right? I don't need you, God, to tell me how to dress up or how to behave. I don't need you, God, to tell me 
which places to visit, which programs to watch on TV. I don't need you, God. I can handle that. And so we end up like this boy. And by the way, this is one of the devil's old lies. We go back to Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, 1 to 5. We can see how the devil wanted Adam and Eve to put God aside and say, I don't need you, God. I can decide for myself what's good and what's wrong. Let's read the story. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? In other words, I thought that every tree belonged to you. How is it that you cannot eat? You don't have freedom. Is that what God said to you? You cannot eat of every tree of the garden? That sounded kind of like what God had said, but it was not what He said. God said you can eat of every tree, but don't touch this one. This is mine. This is a test of obedience. Everything else is yours. But the devil twisted God's words. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. What a lie. You will not surely die. You are dead, but you are not dead. You will continue somehow. For God knows that in the day you eat of this tree, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He was pretty much telling Adam and Eve, you don't need God to tell you what's good and what's bad. God had just said, this is good and this is bad, but the devil says, you don't need him to tell you what to do. If you disobey God, and you eat from this tree, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God. And if you are like God, then you don't need God to tell you what to do. You, you see? That's why there's so many religions today. Everyone claiming to have the truth because they feel that they can interpret God's messages according to their preferences. But we need God more than ever these days. Because there's so many people out there saying, this is my truth. This is my interpretation. All churches teach the truth, some say. Are you sure about that? There's only one truth. And the only one who can tell us that is God. And that happens when we despise God's direction as found in the Bible, as we read really it. If we think for a moment that we only need God, then we're lost. Salvation apart from Jesus does not exist. Because salvation is Jesus Christ. So going back to the story. Um, this young man was not interested in obeying his father, right? He thought that his father was placing too many restrictions. He, he thought that he had no freedom to choose. He misunderstood the father's love and care. And unfortunately, many Christians today manifest the same attitude as you can see today. And they pray to receive God's blessings, but they're not interested in doing God's will. This young man was interested in the father's money, but he was not interested in doing his father's will. The prophet Isaiah prophesied it in Isaiah 4.1 as well, that that would be in the last days the condition of the world before the second coming. Isaiah 4.1 Although this is a prophecy for those days, it also has a fulfillment for our days. Isaiah 4 1 says, And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own food and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. 
if we replace this symbolic language with the symbols, we realize a strong message here for our days. The woman is a symbol of a church. That one man is a symbol of Jesus. Jesus Christ. The food is a symbol of God's Word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the Word of God. That is our food, the Bible, God's Word. Our apparel, it is a symbol as well as uh, uh, of God's righteousness. He will clothe us with His righteousness. And so when we replace these symbols, this verse is actually describing the condition of the world today. Because it says something like this. And in this, in that day, seven churches shall take hold of one man, Jesus Christ, saying, We will have our own interpretation of the Bible. We will declare ourselves righteous, yet we will call ourselves Christians. Let us have your name only. We don't worry about your bread. We don't worry about your apparel. We have our own righteousness. We have our own interpretation of the Bible. We just want to be called Christian. Isn't that what we have today? It was described. But without Jesus, what can we do, right? There is no transformation. There is no hope. <coughs> Let's go back to Luke 15, 14 to 16. What happened to this young man? But when he had spent all the money of his father that did not belong to him just yet, he spent it all. There arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Isn't that what happens when we go away from God? Nothing satisfies. Nothing makes you truly happy. There is always a vacuum. And ultimately, you find yourself completely lost in the world. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pots that the swine ate. And no more. And no one gave him anything. He really went really low. Gone to a far country. Let me ask you again. Have you ever been so far away from God? Have you ever felt that there is no hope for your situation? Have you ever felt that you can no longer change? Let me tell you, that is not true. You can be changed. You can go back to the Father's house at any point in life. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. Jesus can reach you where you are. And He can transform your life no matter how old you are or how young you are. He can. And sometimes God allows us to suffer because that's the only way in which we can realize that we're lost. And only when we find ourselves in that situation, then we go, Oh, I remember that I was happier when I had Jesus in my life. There are many young people today, those precious years of life, their intellect, their visions are being destroyed because they follow the world. All that energy is being consumed in the world. But it is not too late. You can always come back to the Father. No matter who you are. All your spiritual aspirations. Place them in the hands of Jesus. We can be trapped with our own sins. Because sin is like a drug. You taste it. You like it. You want more and more and more. And the only thing that can take you away from that is the power of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says in Proverbs 5, 22, His own iniquities entrap 
the wicked man and he is caught in the cords of his sin. Have you found yourself in this situation before? That there is a sin in your life that you cannot let go? You cannot let go. You know it's bad, but you like it so much that you cannot stop doing that? <coughs> you can be trapped in your own sins. And the only one who can set you free is Jesus Christ. The problem is that we think that we need to free ourselves before we run to Jesus. Let me repeat that. We think that we need to free ourselves from sin before we can come to Jesus. That is a lie. Because Jesus is waiting for you to come just as you are. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. And this young man was struck in his own misery, feeding the swine. That was the lowest thing that a Jew could be placed into. Swine were, were considered to be an unclean animal. And, and any Jew would, wouldn't want to walk any, not even close to a pig. And there he was, feeding the swine, wanting to eat the same food. Have you fallen so low that there is no hope for you? Let me read to you from the spirit of prophecy. Christ, object lessons, page 202. Beautiful thought here. So true. The love of God still yearns over the one who has chosen to separate from Him. And He sets in operation, influences to bring him back to the father's house. The prodigal son in his wretchedness came to himself. The deceptive power that Satan had exercised over him was broken. He saw that his suffering was the result of his own folly. And he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my Father. It doesn't matter what we are doing. How far you think you've gone. It really doesn't matter. Anything you can think of, it doesn't matter. You can always come to your senses and say, I am going to go back to my Father's arms. Don't you think for a moment that He will not receive you? Romans 2.4, let me read to you. Or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? If you spend time with Jesus every day, He will also lead you to repentance. You feel that you don't even have strength to repent? Just spend time with Jesus. You don't believe He can change you? Don't worry. Just spend time with Jesus. And He will cause you to repent. And out of repentance, you will go to Him. Jeremiah 31, 3. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. God loves you with everlasting love. And everlasting means that it never stops. When you reject Him, He loves you. When you love Him, He loves you. When you're gone far away, He loves you. And when you're close to Him, He loves you. He just loves you. And that love, when we spend time with Him and we understand how much He's willing to do for us, that love will conquer your heart. And it was because of the Father's love that this young man of this story decided to go back to the Father's house. Nothing else. He remembered the love of the Father. He remembered His love. And His love conquered His heart back to the Father. And He decided to return. Let's read the story. Finally, and He arose and came to His Father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, 
Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father interrupted him. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Let me ask you one thing. When that young man was with the swine, was he smelling good? Yeah. He was smelling like a pig. His nails were long and dirty. His hair was all long. His clothes looked like rats. And he decided to go to his father's house. Does the story tell us that he went to the hairdresser no. before going to his father's house? Did he take a shower? No. Did he went to have a manicure? No. Did he went to the mall to buy some clothes before going to his father's house? No. Did he do that? No. no. How did he go to his father? As he was. As he was. Now, when we feel repentance, do we need to change before we go to Jesus? No. How do we need to go to Jesus then? As we are. As we are. Smelling like a pig? with all the sins that we have made, in that situation, that's how we need to go to Jesus. But the devil will tell you that you need to change first. And you know what? Sometimes we tell that to people. And when we come to church, we tell them, you need to change, brother, you need to change, sister. Otherwise, you cannot be part of this. And we fall under the same mistake. What we need to do is bring people to the one who can change them. Because we all need to go to Jesus as we are. And so the story says that when the young man came back to the father's house, the father ran to him, kissed him. He had him. To his servants, Take him so he can have a shower before I can hug him. No. He had him as he was. See, if, you, if your sins have caused you to smell like a pig, and you feel that God will not accept you or not forgive you, remember this story. You can go back to Jesus as you are and believe that He will run to you and hug you, and kiss you, and then He will give you new clothes. He will make you clean. He will be happy. It's never too late, you know. No matter what you're doing, no matter how old you are, it's never too late. When the father received his son, and the son said to the father, I am not worthy to be called your son. Where in the story could you see that the father said, yes, you're right, son, you're not worthy to be called my son. He didn't even care about that. He didn't even ask him where you've been. He just said, hey, bring the best clothes that I have. Kill the, the father cup that I have in, my own, in all my property. Let's have a party. Let's celebrate. My son is back to life. And that's exactly how God will receive you and I when we go to His arms. He will kiss us. How far have you gone away from God? Only you know, right? But what I want you to know is that it's never too late. Jesus is waiting with open arms.
It's just like when you're driving, for example, down the highway, and you missed the ramp, the exit, and you've gone past that ramp 20 kilometers. You've driven 20 kilometers in the wrong direction, and suddenly you realize that you've gone 20 kilometers in the wrong direction. What do you do? Make a U-turn. That is repentance. U-turn. You were going this direction, and repentance means that you turn around and you go back in the right direction now. That is repentance. Perhaps you've been traveling in the wrong direction for 20 kilometers. And you've realized it. And now you realize that you, you have to make a U-turn. In other words, bad news and good news at the same time. The bad news is that you have to go back 20 kilometers in the right direction, right? The good news is that the way back to the Father is shorter than those 20 kilometers that you've driven away from you. Why is it shorter? You want to read it in? Let's read Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The moment you show that intention, just the first intention of going back to the father, the father sees you and runs towards you. And that's why the way back to the father's house is much shorter than all the kilometers that you've driven away from him. That is the good news. He will run to, to meet you before you get there. He's missed you so much that he will not stand still until you come to him. He will meet you. So go back to the Father, whoever you are, whatever you've done, just go back and he will run to you. No matter who we are. Arise and go to your Father. Look at this. Christ's Object Lessons, page 206. Beautiful words. Arise and go to your Father, whoever you are. He will meet you a great way off. See? He will run to you before you even know it. If you take even one step toward Him in repentance, He will hasten to enfold you in His arms of infinite love. His ear is open to the cry of the contrite soul. The very first reaching out of the heart after God is known to Him. The very first motive in your heart is noticed by God. Never a prayer is offered, however faltering. Never a tear is shed, however secret. Never a sincere desire after God is cherished, however feeble. But the Spirit of God goes forth to meet it. Even before the prayer is uttered, or the yearning of the heart made known, grace from Christ goes forth to meet the grace that is working upon the human soul. Are you afraid of going back to Jesus then? Will you ever think that you need to change to go to Jesus? Brothers and sisters, let's go back to Jesus just as we are. Don't think that because you're in the church you're saved, because we can be like a coin lost inside the house. Let's go back to Jesus right now and every day just as we are, and He will run to us. He will run to us. Arise. Go back to the Father. One thing I'd like to point out. When the Son returned to His Father's house, who gave the command to put new clothes on Him? Was it the Father or was it the oldest Son? 
That part. You know what I'm trying to say? When someone walks into church, sometimes we get too worried about appearances. If someone who is obviously breaking those laws comes into our church, how do we treat that person? Who is the one who gives new clothes? The father. Not the older brother. We are the older brothers. And so what we need to do when a person comes in, and obviously we know that that person's life is not in line with the Bible, we need to take that person to the one who can change that person. Because we cannot change anyone. That is our job. Because if we tell that person everything that that person needs to change, you think we will change that person? Can we change that person? We cannot even change ourselves. How can we change someone else? But we have to bring that person to the Word and confront that person to God's Word so that the Spirit will tell that person what that person needs to change. And then you will see miracles happen in the lives of those people. You will see decisions that you would have no arguments to convince that person to do, you will see those people changing. How? Because the Holy Spirit can use arguments that we don't have to transform a life. I've been giving Bible studies, I am giving Bible studies recently to uh, four ladies. And I just found out about two weeks ago that two of them are ministers. They just shared that with me. One of them is a retired minister, the other one is, is a minister. And all we've been doing is sharing God's Word. And I've heard decisions being made without me having to force anything on them. Last week I was told, one of them said to me, I have resigned. I'm no longer a pastor of my church. Did I tell them that they needed to do that? Never. I just presented God's Word, they received it, and the Holy Spirit convinced, because I would have no words to convince a pastor to do that. And now, praise the Lord, they are still coming. So eager to learn more and more that they, they've asked to have two studies instead of one per week. So hungry. And I can see the prophecies being fulfilled these days where people are seeking God's truth and they are trying to find it. Are we ready to receive those who are seeking? To receive those in whom, in whom the Holy Spirit is already working? You see, the Holy Spirit has been working and is working in the hearts of many people around our community. And when they come to you, it's like, now the Holy Spirit wants to work with you as well. Are you ready to receive them? Will you treat them like Jesus treated you? Will you bring them closer to Jesus so that they can continue to change? Are you leading by example? These are all questions that I think the Holy Spirit expects us to answer here. But first of all, we need to change. I need to change. And we need Jesus Christ in our lives. Nothing else will change us. So I beg you in the name of Jesus Christ, as you are right now, come to Jesus. Leave the past behind. Leave those concerns and doubts and fears that you cannot change. Leave that behind and come to Jesus as you are because He will wash you. He will take away that smell. He will clip your nails. He will cut your hair. He will make you good and nice. Will you come to Jesus today? Really? Stand up with me then. We're going to pray that that is a reality in our lives. Jesus is waiting with open arms. And He'll receive us with a kiss. The only condition 
is repentance. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, this morning we are so humbled by your infinite love because none of us here deserves to be saved. We should all be lost. We've all walked away from you at one point or another. But we thank you for your infinite love because you receive us as we are. We can always come back to you. We don't have to change before coming back to you just as we are. Please receive us. Look at our hearts. This is who we are. These are all our sins. These are all our struggles. We bring them to you, we present them to you, and we place them into your powerful hands. Because we know that you will change them. We're just here believing that you can do that. And so we look forward for that new cloak that you will put on us the moment that we confess and repent. And we also believe in the power that you can give to us to live a victorious life. Help us also to embrace our brothers and sisters as they come. Help us to remember how you've treated us and how you treat us every day. Help us to bring people to you and to see the miracles that you will do in their lives as well. Bless our efforts. Bless this church. Bless every family and person here. We place before you our sins and temptations and we no longer hold on to them. But we believe that you will transform our hearts if we truly repent. Thank you for receiving us as we are. And thank you that you love us so much that you will not only receive us as we are, but you will not leave us as we are. Thank you for transforming our hearts as we stay connected with you daily. We ask these things without deserving them, but we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.